I'd like to ask Dr. Yoshimitsu Okada, President of National Research Institute for Earth Science and Disaster Prevention, NIED, to lead the first session. Good morning. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity of presentation today. I'd like to uh, introduce the outline of the last year's disastrous earthquake. This background picture is taken at Miyako City. It's just initiation of tsunami. Uh, just like uh, the uh, movie Sugawara-san showed, the tsunami is not a large surf, but this tsunami is a flood coming from ocean. Uh, this earthquake, uh, I, as you know, all of you know, they took place uh, 130 kilometers away from the Tohoku uh, coastline, and uh, this shows the intensity distribution with Japanese seismic intensity scale. The largest intensity was recorded here at Kurihara City uh, with nearly 3G uh, maximum acceleration. The magnitude of this earthquake is 9.0, which is uh, the largest recorded in uh, Japanese history of seismic observation. And as already sh shown, this earthquake is the fourth largest in recent 100 years. And the mechanism of this earthquake is represented like such a diagram. Uh, this is well-known uh, mechanism of uh, interpret earthquake subducting and uh, it's, it's uh, jumped up after the accumulation of this strain here. And this is the uh, plate configuration around Japan and this earthquake took place Pacific plates and North American plates. Uh, only the difference is this focal area was very wide, nearly 500 kilometer by. 200 kilometers. And all of you know, very high tsunami was a, a, attacked the Pacific side, uh, especially the Sandic re region and uh, Miami region. Uh, more than 10 meters was recorded. Uh, this region is uh, frequently attacked by tsunami. The uh, most famous one is 1896 Meiji Sandik Tsunami. Uh, this time, also more than 20,000 people were killed by this earthquake. And in 1933, uh, March the 3rd, uh, the Showa Sandik earthquake all again attacked this region, and more than 3,000 people were killed by this earthquake. And, uh, at both earthquake, this is the recorded tsunami height. Uh, this blue shows the uh, older major earthquake, and the red one is uh, the Shoah earthquake. As you can see, uh, this major earthquake was larger than Shoah earthquake. And the maximum record was uh, around here. 38.2 uh, meter was the uh, Japanese record of the highest tsunami so far. But last year's earthquake uh, exceeded 40 meters and uh, the, this record was renewed like this. And compared to the old two tsunami earthquake, uh, the most big difference is uh, the south from Sendai. Uh, the previous two earthquakes uh, not so high uh, as this region, but uh, the last year's earthquake also attacked uh, the south from this Sendai city. That is a uh, big difference. And as Sugawara has already introduced, uh, we knew the uh, old times Jogan earthquake attacked uh, more than 1,000 years ago, and 1,000 deaths is recorded at this Tagajo city uh, near Sendai. 
And uh, this tsunami deposit survey revealed uh, this earthquake was modeled by uh, nearly 200 kilometer wide focal region by strip of seven meter. And uh, this uh, corresponds to the magnitude 8.3. Uh, from this source model, we can simulate the inundation of the tsunami like this. Uh, let's compare uh, this record to the uh, last year's inundation area uh, recorded by uh, satellite image like this. You can uh, see very uh, similar pattern like this. And just the boundary of this tsunami coming and uh, not coming area, it's located a uh, shrine called the Namiwake Shrine. Na Namiwake means a split of the uh, wave. So ancient, ancient people uh, taught us uh, be cautious. <coughs> Uh, the tsunami <coughs> sometimes comes at this point. This shrine locates nearly five kilometers from this coastline. And uh, when we compare uh, the before and after this earthquake, uh, the eastern part of Japan uh, caused very uh, big cluster deformation. Uh, uh, horizontally, the Pacific side moves four to five meters to east. On the contrary, Japan seaside moves uh, one or two meters to east. So it results, say, uh, about four meter extension of this, uh, across this token region. And this causes the induced seismicity in a wide area of East Japan. And also, uh, the vertical deformation uh, Pacific side, all subsides are several uh, tens of centimeters, and the largest uh, substance is observed at this uh, point, more than 100 meters. And this causes uh, the uh, difficulty for the people or living this coastal region. It's a permanent uh, depression. Let's take the typical point. Uh, this is the Minami Sanrik town, as uh, Dr. Sugawara said, uh, moves 44.4 4 meter to east southeast and shows uh, 75 centimeter down of the ground. I'm living in, at Tsukuba city. Uh, Tsukuba moves 50 centimeter to east and 10 centimeter down. Even Tokyo moves by this earthquake 20 centimeter to east and five centimeter down. So it was very, very big earthquake. And such a crustal deformation is reasonable in the view of elasticity theory of these locations. Uh, if such a thrust movement occurred, uh, the internal of elasticity body uh, moves like this. If this strip is, for example, 20 meter, uh, this scale corresponds to 40 centimeters. And just above the source, uh, the ground or uh, sea bottom goes up and causes big tsunami. And also, at the land area, uh, moves toward the source horizontally and shows uh, substance. So it's not surprising uh, such a uh, deformation that the amount of this deformation was uh, too big compared to the uh, past. And after the occurrence of earthquake, uh, the movement does not stop. Uh, it's still moving very gradually without causing earthquake. This showed until the end of uh, October, the additional eastward movement is continued, the, uh, the maximum about nearly 80 centimeters movement, and uh, vertical uh, after effect is rather complex. Uh, this area uh, from Sendai to Choshi regions, the recovering the uh, su uh, subsidence at the time of earthquake, but this Sanlik region shows additional subsidence, and this movement is still going now. Uh, of course, uh, uh, although the, the rate is decreasing. Uh, using these data, uh, many 
uh, model the proposed uh, what happened at the source. Uh, this is uh, using the seismic data. Uh, the left word is using strong motion records, and uh, the right one is the uh, broadband seismic record uh, worldwide. Uh, and this color counter shows the offset uh, between the uh, two uh, uh, Pacific plates and, and oceanic plates and uh, inland plate. And the biggest offset, nearly 50 meter, is observed. Uh, both models show uh, near the deepest point, uh, Japan Trench. So uh, such a big offset causes uh, large, generate large tsunami on here. And from tsunami data also, uh, we can uh, uh, estimate the, uh, the source movement at the point. And this also uh, records similar results. Uh, more than 40 meters displacement is expected near this Japan trench. And even at the uh, inland most uh, near place, more than 10 meters displacement uh, between uh, subjecting plate uh, can be estimated. And let's overlight the uh, focal region of uh, uh, already occurred earthquake. This is for Meiji Sandic earthquake, and this is 1933 Showa Sandic earthquake. And this is the uh, 869 Jogan earthquake. And if we uh, calculate uh, the deformation of the sea bottom using these models, this Sandik, Showa uh, Sandik earthquake is rather uh, as, uh, uh, extraordinary uh, earthquake. It's occurred outside of the uh, Japan trench and shows uh, normal force type movement like this. And this major aspect and Jogan aspect both occurred at the uh, upper boundary of uh, downgoing Pacific plate. But uh, the focal depth is shallower than Mage, and Jogan aspect was rather deeper. And these fault movement causes uh, the sea bottom like this. This red color, red source and blue source causes a very sharp but very high amplitude tsunami. And uh, this attacked to the land very high uh, tsunami height. <coughs> On the contrary, this Jovan earthquake is rather uh, deep. So this causes a rather broad pattern, a broad shape of sea bottom change. And this is reflected to the sea surface change. And this moves to the land and uh, causes uh, the invade to the uh, uh, to the depths to the land land that you, you can see in a, a Sendai plains. So uh, this time, uh, last year's earthquake can be considered uh, this blue colored source and green colored source occurred simultaneously. So it becomes such a big earthquake. Finally, uh, this shows the slip model using the cluster deformation uh, using the technique of global positioning system. The left-hand side is the uh, co-seismic uh, movement. Uh, this model is, uh, uh, shows the largest offset of 25 meters around here, uh, just near epicenter. And after earthquake, has uh, namely felt earthquake stopped, the steel uh, moving very, very gradually uh, within uh, uh, seven months, uh, the rather deeper position uh, shows the offset of 2.5 meter, namely uh, one order small offset. And this movement is still uh, ongoing 
uh, even at now. Okay, uh, next is the aftershocks. Uh, we have experienced the enormous number of aftershocks associated to this earthquake. Uh, this is main shock, and just 20 minutes after this earthquake, uh, the magnitude 7.4 earthquake took place here, and uh, 30, minutes later, 30 minutes later, magnitude 7.7, .7, the largest aftershock <coughs> occurred here. And uh, the 40 minutes later, the main shock, uh, the outside of Japan's range, point the 7.5 earthquake <coughs> occurs. So uh, just after this main shock, uh, the largest rear aftershock occurred. And uh, this yellow one is the earthquake of magnitude uh, 6 or more. And if we align this earthquake along this uh, space axis A to B and take time, as the occurrence, from occurrence of the main shock to the end of the March, uh, as you can see, the earthquake number is gradually decreasing. And the largest Monster 7 class is only occurred uh, just after the earthquake. And if we count the earthquake number, accumulate number, uh, magnitude 5 or more, and it, it exceeds 300 within one week. And if we compare the previous interplate earthquake around Japan, it's a very <coughs> great number of aftershocks uh, continued. Uh, usually, usual amongst eight plus earthquake is only 30 to 40 earthquake, but 10 times larger uh, this time. But it's not surprising, it's because this focal area is too wide. This is the same figure, and uh, the most aftershocks occurred in this uh, ocean, oceanic region, and this is the normal aftershocks in narrow sense. Namely, uh, the near fourth surface, the many, many aftershocks uh, continued. So it's not surprising, but uh, other than this earthquake, uh, the day after the main shock, uh, at such a point, at the boundary of Nagano and the Niigata prefecture, uh, the magnitude 6.7 earthquake occurred. And at that evening, also magnitude 6 event occurred offshore of Akita prefectures. And later, uh, March the 15th, midnight, uh, the magnitude 6.4 event occurred at this Shizuoka prefecture. It's just beneath the Mount Fuji, very shallow events. And also, uh, until recently, the very uh, high seismicity is continued at the boundary of Fukushima and Ibaraki prefectures. And Mansu 6 <coughs> earthquake, many Mansu 6 earthquake uh, continued. Uh, this region was uh, previous, uh, previous uh, before, prior to the uh, aftershock, this is very low uh, seismically active region, no, not active region. If we extend uh, to the uh, two months after the occurrence of this main shock, a uh, two months of seven earthquake aftershock were added. These were, uh, one is uh, just offshore of Miyagi's prefecture. So it's a fairly deep one, nearly 70 kilometer depth. The one more is the uh, very shallow earthquake. Uh, the surface rupture was observed uh, associated to this Mount Seven earthquake. Uh, this is Iwaki City, located in Iwaki City. And such a shallow earthquake accompanied a uh, great number of aftershocks of these aftershocks. So if we see from this uh, main shock, the uh, grand child of this earthquake. And after this event, uh, the felt earthquake's number uh, again increased, and uh, it's uh, still this activity is continued until recent. And there are uh, various kind of mechanism of earthquake uh, took place. Uh, let's show in cartoon 
uh, the main shock and northmost and south southernmost after shocks uh, this such a break boundary earthquake and this causes uh, extraction here extension here and contraction here so this causes the pair of this earthquake and this earthquake and while this uh, shallow one is um, uh, by the ex extraction of this ground and be before this earthquake uh, we have one Huashok activity uh, we know later, but this is two days before magnitude 7.3, fairly big earthquake occurred, and this is decreased. But if uh, this occur, uh, if Japan earthquake was triggered, may triggered by this earthquake. And long term forecast was done by Japanese government, and we are expecting at this region, magnitude 7.5 earthquake will attack. Uh, with coming 30 years with 99%. So this was uh, true, uh, this earthquake was started from here, but we can never imagine this uh, expands such a big region. And uh, finally, uh, this is the uh, casualties uh, statistics uh, already shown by Fujisugawara-san. And so uh, let's analysis of the people's behavior. Uh, the pre-assessed level is here, and all the uh, pre preparedness of coastal barrier of a shelter house or something uh, arranged, prepared like this, and people, or, and uh, f first warning, the Japan Meteorological Agency issues a tsunami warning at to survive uh, the three meter height in uh, Iwate Prefecture and Fukushima Prefecture and, the Miyagi, and six meter to Miyagi Prefecture because they have underestimated the earthquake magnitude as 9.7. So the people uh, behave in a very manner. One group did not escape because they simply neglected earthquake early warning or they relied on the uh, previous assessment, so they uh, don't think it is necessary to uh, escape. And the second people are evacuated back to the uh, planned level, namely they uh, followed to the manual, previous manual. So uh, assessment or quick warning. And the last group uh, escaped more higher level with a mind of safety first. But actual tsunami was as high as uh, more than 10 meters or so, and this divide dead or alive. So the lessons we must learn is by the contrast of this group one and group three, uh, the education is very, very important. And the second, uh, the previous assessment determines such a manual so the reasonable assessment is very vital. So <coughs> from now, uh, the Dr. Fujiwara will uh, 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 explain about the Japanese status. And next, uh, the Dr. Rothstein will uh, state uh, the uh, worldwide uh, status uh, uh, regarding to this state this component. And finally, warning system also should be improved. So uh, we are now uh, started the, to make cable ocean bottom observation system uh, covering the whole East <coughs> Japan uh, near associated to the uh, Japan Trench. This year, uh, we have we are planning to make this green, uh, red color and green color, each have 25 uh, ocean bottom seismometer and tsunami uh, sensors. And next year, we added these three regions. And at the third year, we uh, construct this outerized uh, ocean cable network. And by completion of this network, uh, we expect more rapid and accurate warning of earthquake and tsunami become possible. Thank you.
Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Fujiwara. Uh, seismic hazard assessment uh, before and after the top scale. <coughs> yeah. National seismic hazard assessment project started after a Kobe earthquake, uh, Hansi earthquake disaster in 1995, uh, seven, 17 years ago. And uh, I have uh, been uh, engaging uh, the project as a project leader. And I have made a seismic hazard assessment uh, like this. Uh, the hazard assessment is based on the long-term evaluation of uh, earthquake occurrence, and also a strong ground motion uh, evaluation. If the earthquake occurred, uh, uh, ground how to uh, um, shape. And we have uh, two kind of uh, hazard maps. Uh, Progress seismic hazard maps. Uh, this hazard map are based on the Progress seismic hazard assessment. And another kind of uh, hazard map is uh, scenario earthquake shaking map uh, for individual earthquakes. Uh, to uh, make these hazard maps, we need a lot of uh, information on earthquakes. Uh, to, uh, for long term evaluation, we have to evaluate the occurrence of the earthquakes with uh, probability and strong motion evaluation uh, we have to calculate ground motion using the <laughs> underground structure so uh, we have made a lot of uh, information database and this uh, project was uh, uh, promoted by uh, headquarters for earthquake research promotion the headquarters are uh, established after the Kobe earthquakes and uh, Mm. Headquarters consists of two committees, policy committee and earthquake research committee. The uh, hazard mapping project, uh, earthquake research committee, is, uh, was uh, responsible for uh, <coughs> hazard maps. And many uh, institutes uh, or uh, universities uh, mm, carried out uh, observation or analysis. And this is an uh, uh, example. Uh, development of uh, integrated geophysical and geological information database. To make a, a hazard map, we need underground structure. So uh, many institutes uh, collaborate and make a database for all over Japan. And based on these data, we uh, made an underground structure for all over Japan. And hazard maps are released in 2005. Uh, and the data is very Right. So we developed the uh, web system to release uh, hazard, uh, seismic hazard uh, information, uh, Japan Seismic Hazard Information Station. So uh, everyone can access our website and download uh, or see uh, hazard maps data like this. And last year, just one year ago, uh, we had uh, very large earthquake disaster in Tohoku area. The earthquake magnitude is magnitude nine. It's a very huge. And uh, this figure shows the uh, uh, peak acceleration distribution uh, catched by the observation network, strong ground motion network of our institute. We, our institute operated more than 1,000 uh, strong ground motion observations. Um, this figure shows the uh, distribution. And um, more than 1,200 uh, 1, uh, stations catch the uh, ground motion, and the, uh, 20 <coughs> sites, uh, the peak guard uh, exceeds uh, more than uh, 1G, and the maximum peak ground acceleration was uh, 2,930. Three cars, the very big. Uh, this figure shows the uh, 
of the uh, recorded uh, wave forms uh, shaking. Uh, wave form is very complicated and very long time, uh, more than five minutes. Uh, and uh, this um, figure shows that uh, um, rupture on the uh, surface board is very complicated. So um, it is difficult to predict before asking Hoka to uh, this type of grand motion. And uh, in, uh, our institute have a lot of uh, observation station in Tohoku Bay area, uh, the Pacific coastal region. Uh, some of them are damaged, uh, suffering from a tsunami, and uh, some uh, stations are um, vanished. Uh, Kenneth Street observation station and the Kitnet station are like this. <coughs> and, um, uh, this figure shows the height of the tsunami and the inundation, inundation area of the tsunami. Uh, in, uh, <coughs> in this region, uh, the height of the tsunami is more than uh, 10 meters, very high. And in this region, uh, in inundation area is very large. So, yes. And uh, this is an uh, overview of damage. Uh, mm, uh, missing and dead distribution practice. Uh, mm, coastal, uh, Pacific coastal region are uh, very large because of the tsunami. And this figure shows the uh, mm, house damages, uh, shaking and, and tsunami. This red zone are uh, mainly by uh, tsunami. And this uh, Zone uh, mainly uh, shaking like this. And uh, this table shows the economic impact uh, for the building damage, lifeline damage, and infrastructure like this. And this is uh, the Great East Japan aspect. And this is a Hanshi Awaji Kobe aspect. And oh, this table uh, shows the claims paid for major disaster uh, in East Japan Narsuke, the very large. And this is a uh, claims paid practice, a uh, harsh like practice. Uh, now, uh, earthquake insurance has um, increased, so the um, claims paid is very large. But uh, the ratio uh, in Japan, uh, for Japan is uh, if we compare, uh, uh, the, uh, the record uh, USA uh, um, grant and paid the ratio is very small. And lessons from the top of uh, uh, this earthquake disaster is a complex wide area disaster and the limits of crisis management for complex wide area disaster were exposed. And the lack of other views for response to the disasters. And lack of uh, comprehensive measures. Uh, elementary technologies <laughs> were effective. For example, uh, earthquake proof technology works well now in Japan, but uh, limits of uh, elementary technology uh, that are optimized for event in the expected. So, unexpected event, uh, it's not worked. Uh, Lack of uh, measures for unexpected events. So, so <coughs> in the future, we need an uh, integrated system for the disaster mitigation, uh, <coughs> I think. And uh, this figure shows the comparison between the hazard maps and the <coughs> storm motions. Uh, the background and figure um, shows the uh, seismic intensity with 2% probability of accidents in 50 years. Uh, and um, with uh, Sarkar and uh, or Brian uh, showed that uh, without uh, ground motion. Uh, in this area, in Fukushima Prefecture and the northern part of Ibaraki Prefecture, uh, the shaking uh, record is uh, 
uh, rise. So uh, um, the seismic hazard assessment <coughs> was uh, underestimated for these areas because uh, um, oh, for the uh, probably seismic hazard assessment, we use uh, this uh, uh, flowchart. Uh, at first, uh, moderate the seismic activity and uh, evaluate uh, occurrence probability and evaluate uh, ground motion and uh, get the seismic hazard for each earthscape and uh, finally we uh, calculate for all earthscapes for the seismic hazard. Oh. To evaluate uh, seismic hazard, we need a uh, hmm, long-term uh, evaluation for all earthquakes. Uh, this figure is the result of uh, inland earthquake evaluation, and this figure shows the uh, um, evaluation for uh, subduction of earthquakes. After Kobe earthquakes um, in Japan, uh, our community uh, evaluated these type of earthquakes. And based on uh, this uh, evaluation, we uh, um, assessed it. Seismic hazard, but in this area uh, before the Tohoku asking, uh, we divided uh, the area into a small uh, region like this, and in each uh, region, uh, aspects uh, mm, repeat occur. Uh, in the historical record, uh, we know the aspect uh, occurred repeat the same side. On real, um, approximately the same size as uh, repeatedly occurred, but we couldn't imagine uh, at the same time uh, every rate, um, all rate uh, um, break. So we couldn't uh, um, take into account of this, such a large aspect. This figure uh, shows that uh, the assessment of uh, before. Uh, the talk asking. Uh, this figure uh, shows a characteristic asking for each region like this. And uh, this is a background aspect uh, magnitude. Uh, uh, the maximum magnitude is relatively small. So uh, to make a seismic hazard assessment, uh, we need to model a seismic activity. Uh, uh, in the seismic activity model, uh, we consider two kinds of earthquakes. Uh, earthquake with specified fault means uh, evaluated earthquake. Uh, uh, where earthquake is occurred, uh, we know. But background earthquake is uh, earthquake with uh, uncertainty. We, uh, before earthquake occurred, uh, we couldn't, uh, uh, we can, cannot say where the earthquake occurred or magnitude like this. Uh, so it is uh, important how to uh, uh, evaluate this uh, kind of background earthquake with a uh, very large uncertainty. So, but it is uh, before top earthquake, uh, it is not insufficient to uh, make uh, this kind of earthquake uh, model. So, uh, for seismic hazard assessment, uh, uh, treatment of uncertainty is a very important subject. Uh, we uh, consider two um, kinds of uncertainty. Uh, the first is uh, aleatory uncertainty. This is uh, intrinsic uh, uncertainty and are represented by a uh, random variable. And using, uh, uh, and uh, other kind of uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty. Uh, um, this um, kind of uh, uncertainty is uh, a lack of knowledge and data and uh, differences in judgment. And usually uh, evaluated by uh, using a now, logic tree. But uh, before the talk escape, uh, um, I think uh, the uh, treatment or handling of 
epistemic uncertainty is um, not in, uh, sufficient because uh, in long-term uh, evaluation committee, uh, only uh, most probable case uh, is considered and uh, um, the case with uh, large uncertainty is not considered and ignored. So uh, before uh, Tohoku earthquake, we discussed about uh, Jogan tsunami earthquake. Uh, the Tohoku earthquake uh, occurred in March, and, but we discussed uh, in uh, February, we discussed Jogan tsunami earthquake in the um, long term evaluation. But uh, some, some committee member says that uh, Jogan tsunami earthquake has uh, a lot of uh, very large uncertainty, so it is difficult to um, evaluate. And we um, uh, couldn't model it, uh, into model it, uh, these kinds of uh, the earthquake. So uh, the uh, problems that must be overcome in the, the first uh, is the uh, modeling of seismic activity with no oversight and the preparation of strong ground motion for uh, such a low probability earthquake and astrology to select appropriate scenario earthquake from pro, uh, seismic. Uh, as a model and uh, methodology for prediction of strong ground motion for the mega structure And now uh, mm, we consider uh, how to make a, a background aspect modeling. And, uh, this is a uh, Gutenberg Richter relation. It's a very old relation, but very important, I think, because uh, this is a magnitude nine aspect here for this region. Uh, this is a magnitude and this is a, a annual rate, uh, annual number of the earthquake. So, uh, mm, this is very mm, clear. Uh, if uh, for magnitude 8 earthquake, uh, we have experience uh, like this. And if we use this uh, Gutenberg-Richter law for this area, we can uh, predict uh, minus nine aspect. Uh, predict, but uh, when we couldn't predict, but uh, we assume the minus nine aspect for this area. And after uh, the talk aspect, uh, we are now improving the modeling of the seismic activity model. And uh, this is the tentative modeling for uh, this area. In these areas, um, the nine earthquake uh, has occurred, but uh, background uh, seismic activity is very high. So now we assume that uh, maximum magnitude uh, for these areas is uh, eight or more large, like this. And this is a, a calculation for seismic hazard. Uh, if we know the uh, torque type earthquake before the torque earthquake occurred, uh, like why? Um, and the, in the modeling, we assume that uh, torque earthquake interval is uh, 600 years. Uh, then uh, the occurrence probability just before the uh, torque uh, Mm. that uh, ASCAE got uh, 15%. So uh, this is the seismic hazard map before uh, talk ASCAE. If we know the talk ASCAE correctly, um, this area is hazard to increase like this. And also we need uh, another kind of Hazard maps. Uh, this hazard maps is uh, for long uh, uh, occurrence period, uh, return period uh, for one thousand years, ten thousand years, and a hundred thousand years. Right? Like uh, very uh, long uh, return period. We uh, If we uh, consider only one thousand years. Uh, Hazard maps like this. Uh, because uh, in this map, uh, we only consider subduction zone type earthquake only. And 
because uh, the uh, aspects in active fault uh, uh, return uh, period is more than uh, several thousand. So uh, in this kind of uh, hazard map, we couldn't show the uh, effect from the uh, active fault. Uh, for uh, in 10,000 years, uh, uh, main active fault aspect uh, <coughs> we can take into account at a part of the uh, inland aspect. But if we consider uh, 100,000 years uh, return period, uh, we can uh, consider all of, uh, possible aspects in uh, Japan like this. So uh, I think uh, we have to use uh, two kinds of uh, um, probably seismic hazard assessment result. It's, it's uh, long, uh, uh, average to long uh, time, uh, average to low probability seismic hazard maps. And also we need a um, short period seismic hazard maps. And in the future, we have to uh, prepare large aspects uh, in uh, in our evaluation uh, in Kanto area and Nan uh, Tokai, to Nankai, and Nankai areas with uh, very large aspects. <laughs> and this is assumed uh, uh, estimated uh, damage for assumed aspect. Uh, or Nankai Tora uh, aspect is like this. Uh, mm, this uh, is a mm, very large uh, than Tokyo aspect, so it's a very mm, severe problem for Japan. And to prepare the uh, aspect disaster risk, by uh, mm, so we uh, studied the uh, mm, some information system, and uh, mm, not only the hard, but also we uh, use the soft. Uh, uh, we prepared uh, the disaster risk, uh, mm, not only expertise, but also uh, knowledge on the region or knowledge on the servers or experimental knowledge uh, to use all. Uh, knowledge, uh, we make intelligence uh, for the asking and research, uh, disaster risk. This. And um, now uh, in our institute, uh, we are uh, developed the disaster risk information platform, both at root, uh, using the, uh, uh, the risk information. Are, uh, there are many uh, institute or uh, many uh, um, organization have a uh, lot of information, but it's uh, dispersed. So uh, mm, the internet, uh, using the uh, internet system, and uh, uh, we uh, have to uh, develop the interoperative uh, information system for uh, 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 <coughs> reduce the earthquake or uh, natural disaster. Thank you very much.
think what we've learned from the last uh, several hours is that there were mistakes made in Japan, both in the forecast of the hazard and the response to the emergency. But we mustn't forget that no other country could have done as well as Japan. That if this magnitude 9 earthquake had occurred anywhere else, we would be measuring the deaths in hundreds of thousands and not tens of thousands. And that the loss of life, not only through the tsunami, but the shaking, would have been vastly worse. So I want to turn your attention for a moment toward the problem that we have on a global scale. The problem that, for the most part, Japan has handled very, very well. This is a typical building throughout the world, here in Washington, D.C., in particular, in the developing world. And we have chosen, collectively, to build buildings by a stack of cubes. And cubes, or if we want to be technical about it, tetrahedra, have no structural integrity. By that, what I mean is, no matter how strong we make the columns and beams, cubes are held up by their corners. They're only as strong as their corners. So in this two-story building, what happens in most earthquakes is the ground moves side to side. And you can see, if these corners are weak, this building is going through very, very large changes. To some extent, in particular in these great subduction earthquakes, there's also vertical motion. This building is also weak. And all earthquakes involve torsion, twisting motion. And again, this building is weak. If any one of these corners goes down during the shaking, or corners breaks during the shaking, this building is coming down. It's going to collapse. And that's because there's no strength carried by anything but those corners. Now here I've made the exact same building with the same materials, but I've snapped in, just snapped in, these little corner braces. So this building cost 15% more, 15%, not much, to build. It involves 15% more materials. Look. Look. No torsion. This is the difference between a disaster and success. This is the distance, difference, between Indonesia and Japan, or Iran and California. And what's startling and and uh, gives us pause, is that this, going from this to this, doesn't cost much. But no one will make that change unless they're convinced they're at risk. So the responsibility of my community as a geophysicist or a seismologist, and I think the entire earth science and engineering communities, is to calculate that risk for the world and convey it to people, and to give them the tools to contend with it. Now, of course, this is one way to strengthen this building. And all strengthening of a cube is handled through triangles. Whether or not it's these little corners, or some kind of crisscross beams or cables, or even shear wall, a, let's say, a plywood. People have this thing for windows and doors, so you don't necessarily see a building completely sheathed in plywood. If it's a reinforced concrete building, as I imagine this one is, the strength of the corners is provided not through these braces, but by rebar, steel ribbed bars that go through the concrete pillars and flare out in all directions. And that rebar strengthening is massive in the corners if the building is going to survive. Now here's the problem. We're sitting in this building. We don't know if there's any rebar in there. We don't know how strong this building is. If concrete were translucent, we would have a safer world. But hidden behind the concrete is any error that the contractor made. And so we live in buildings, and we don't really know how strong they are. I work extensively in Turkey and uh, visited a building where we had interviewed survivors of the earthquake. And uh, they, they, the, this young couple had survived, their son had not. And we came to the building, and I saw a huge crack in the, B, in, the, in the beam column connection. I was with the documentary film crew, and I said, put me on the hydraulic lift. I want to be lifted up there. I want to put my arm into the crack. I want to feel the rebar and see how much there was there. Why did this building go down? And they put me up there, and I put my arm in, and I pulled out styrofoam. Wow. Styrofoam. 
what's going on here? Is the contractor bulking up the cement to get a little bit more profit? Is it just lack of knowledge? As long as we have styrofoam in here, the world is an unsafe place. And I want you to think a minute how uh, almost ludicrous it is that we've all made this decision to live in a stack of cubes. If we lived in geodesic domes, if you know what a geodesic dome is, we wouldn't be meeting here. We wouldn't be discussing earthquake hazards because no one would die with the exception of tsunamis. But the problem with domes is they don't stack. So we don't use them and we condemn ourselves into living in the most difficult kind of structure. So what do we do about this? My view is that we need an, a mission that is focused on letting people understand their risks and giving them the tools to deal with. And that's why we launched the Global Earthquake Model three years ago, which is building a seismic risk model for the world and providing not only the information of the likelihood of an earthquake striking you, but also the consequences of that earthquake and death and damage and dollars and also tools. If you're a finance minister in Istanbul, you need not to just know that there's an earthquake that could be coming. We could be accused of scaring people when we do that. That finance minister needs to know what would be the consequences of strengthening the schools and hospitals. What would that buy us in terms of reduction in the loss of life? What would be the consequence of putting a catastrophe bond on the market? So after that earthquake, I had an immediate infusion of cash for the rescue that we see that Japan so beautifully undertook after the Tohoku earthquake. Unless we give people not only information, but tools that they can use, we know what people will do. They will flip between denial and panic. And there'll be nothing in between, and there'll be no rational decision made. So I want to just show you what the global earthquake model is about and why it is one approach to the problem that I think is worth pursuing. Let's look at where most of the world is living in megacities. This is Bogota, six million people living in a basin next to an active fault. Basins amplify the shaking. It's like pouring sand on a drum skin and then beating on the drum. This is a prescription for disaster. Tehran, Iran, 15, 18 million people. No building codes, no building standards. Another disaster waiting to happen. This country is spending its money instead on building nuclear weapons. So we can see how money is spent, and in particular, we can't quite fault Iran if we're not able to explain to the Persian people what the consequences would be of deciding to live more safely, of putting their money there. Algiers, Algeria, just down the way, a 2,000 earthquake killed 6,000 people, a relatively small earthquake, a magnitude 6.8. Port-au-Prince, Haiti. As we all know, an earthquake in 2010 took over 200,000 lives. But unfortunately, the part of the fault that ruptured is over here. The part of the fault closest to the city has not yet ruptured, and it has been stressed by that 2010 earthquake. So we may not have experienced yet the disaster that could still befall a place that is riddled with buildings, which are themselves seismic bombs. So we know how people are living in most cities. So here's a typical construction. Notice the strong corners in the buildings. We know what's going to happen to this building. This is what happened, for example, in the 2004 Kashmir earthquake in Pakistan. Again, a relatively small earthquake, magnitude 7.6, about one hundredth the size of the earthquake that we had in Tohoku. On this hill, which was shoved upward against the fault in the earthquake. Every single building has been destroyed. 1,600 people lost their lives there. It might as well now be a cemetery. But people don't have to live that way, even relatively impoverished people. Here's a building I came upon in Manizales, Colombia. It's made of the local bamboo, bamboo that we also have in Japan. This building is filled with triangles. This building is going to stand in the earthquake. 
It's heavy on the bottom and light on top, just the opposite to the problem that we typically have in most buildings. Now let me show you where the problem lies for earthquake uh, deaths and earthquake risks in the world. And I want to show you that just by showing you global population. So first, here's the population in Europe and North Africa. This is from the LandScan database, very high resolution, one kilometer population database collected by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I don't really want to know why a bomb lab is collecting world population data, but I'm glad we can use it. Until I looked at this map, I didn't realize that Egypt is not a country. It's a river. It's just a river of humanity and nothing else. I also hadn't understood that no one's home in Switzerland. <laughs> now, if we roughly put up the number of the cities, mega cities, cities over a million people at risk, and Jim is going to do this in a much better way, but this is a rough picture. We can see that Tehran and Istanbul and Algiers are some of the disaster areas that could befall us. Now what I want to do is remove the cities, and I want to flip this map over over and show you the population in Asia at the same density scale. And now you see the real problem. You see the dramatic increase in population density in Asia. And if we start to put up the cities, now we get 10 times the number of cities. In all likelihood, you were looking at the part of the map where some period in our lifetime, we will experience the million death earthquake. This is not a prophecy, it's just statistics. You can see, for example, that a great subduction zone lies against Jakarta, the most populated, I mean Java, the most populated island on Earth. You can see the enormous density of population in western China. This is where the Wenchan earthquake killed 80,000 people uh, in 2005. You can see the enormous population in Bangladesh 600 people, 600 million people living in the Ganges Plain. Let me close up on that so that you can see that there have been a series of magnitude eight and up to nine, probably 1505 earthquake was a nine, earthquakes over the last six centuries. This area is laced by active faults. The Indians are rapidly building hydroelectric facilities to provide power and water to grow their economy. Those facilities are very vulnerable to earthquake disasters. The Ganges Plain will shake very hard in any of these earthquakes. I want to point out this site over here in 1897 produced an earthquake just below magnitude 8. It reduced every masonry building to rubble over an area the size of England. Today the population is 20 times higher there and the building standards are no higher than they were then. So we really have to concern ourselves with what this means for Asia. And this is why we lo launched GEM uh, in 2009, which is building a seismic risk model for the world and trying to make it understandable and actionable for all people. And GEM's imperatives are very simple. It comes to as a surprise to no one in this world that Japan and California and a few other countries are producing, putting enormous resources into earthquake research. And there is no country that comes close to matching the earthquake research and understanding commitment of Japan. It's second to none. It's when all of us researchers spend a great deal of time in Japan because of the quality of the monitoring network and because of the quality of the scientists. But we know where the deaths and damage are going to come from. They're going to come in the place where we're putting no money and almost no effort. We also know that to improve seismic hazard assessment, the process that Fujiwara said was talking about, it is almost impossible to do that only by studying Japan. Even though Japan has six times the rate of earthquakes as California, and almost six times its history, even in Japan, they couldn't figure out what the full range of earthquake possibilities would be. Do you think we're going to do it right in California under these circumstances? Don't be fooled. The only way we're really going to understand earthquake hazards is to make global models, because only then do we get enough large earthquakes in a short amount of time that we can actually learn and test modeling. So there's a, a scientific imperative to conduct this in addition to a humanitarian one. 
And when you go back to that issue of India, of course the Indian government has a reason, if you like, a disincentive to be candid about earthquake hazards because that interferes with its economic growth. The same thing is happening in China. The Wenshan earthquake occurred right under a giant reservoir that had just been filled. Did the filling of that reservoir hasten the earthquake? It's an argument that's raging, and you can imagine which side of the argument the Chinese government is on. We need to have an independent, credible, authoritative voice for earthquakes that is non-governmental, that is non-commercial, and that's what JEM aims to be. Now, JEM is a public-private partnership, and so we have, we're fortunate to have nine companies on board and 13 countries, and we're growing, and we welcome new members to this group. These companies are doing something rather unique and important, actually courageous, to provide information and, and uh, funds for the public good. That's a difficult thing to do in, an, in a competitive world. And these countries are also contributing funds and researchers to this effort. Now, of course, I would love to see Japan's flag uh, flying among these others because there is no question that there is no country that could provide more leadership and more understanding about earthquakes, particularly in the light of the Tohoku experience and all that's been learned from it that we've seen in Okada-san and Fujiwara-san's presentations. Let me tell you briefly how GEM functions. We're building open, we have built open source software, OpenQuake, which we believe will become the international standard for calculating seismic hazards around the world. This is available to everyone freely. We're also collecting the global data sets without which we don't think we can do a good job in hazard estimation. For example, there's no seismologist in the world who would argue with the statement that earthquakes occur on faults and that large earthquakes occur on large faults. And so you would think to do this, we would start with an inventory of the world's active faults, and we have not. So GEM has launched an international consortia for $1 million to collect that data. Another example, if we want to understand the vulnerability of society to earthquakes, we need an inventory of the world's buildings. And we need to understand the fragility of those buildings. Are they one, the one on the right or the one on the left? For a million and a half dollars, GEM has launched an inter international consortia to collect that information for the world. But GEM won't be making the models. This is the most important thing. We are going to be empowering national scientists in their country to use our software, our data, and theirs to build their models. Because it's our bet that the only way you convince a government that this is legitimate and appropriate is if it's built by scientists in that country who need to be the authoritative spokesmen to their government. So it's not a bunch of Westerners in a room. It's people who are given the tools to do something according to an international standard. So we're collecting these data sets to build the tools that people need so they can make decisions and try to address the problem. Obviously, if you're the government of Haiti, you have some other problems to contend with beside earthquakes, and they're all legitimate. So you have to prioritize. You have to understand, what, what can I do that really makes a difference? And I think in retrospect, we could all say, had the hospitals alone been retrofitted at relatively small cost in Haiti, the death toll would have been much lower because of the absence of emergency medical care. And I want to show you one example of how GEM is functioning. Here's our, our global historical catalog. Again, you can see the disproportionate number of great earthquakes that have occurred in Asia. And in fact, you see the same thing in Latin America. This is Ecuador, that little arrow is. And we have a workshop in Ecuador, and Ecuador decided to join GEM. Every country, the cost of joining GEM is based on a country's uh, investment in research and development. So it only cost 15,000 euros a year for Ecuador to join. Now here's Ecuador's problem. Its capital, Quito, two miles high, two million people, living on top of an active fault in a basin with structures like the one closer to me. It's another disaster waiting to happen. But Ecuador had no seismic risk model. Without a model, you can't have insurance, you can't have investment. So with GEM's help, Ecuador created its first ever seismic risk model. 
And as a result of that model, they're building their first ever building code to design this, the con conditions under which the buildings need to be built. And with this model, insurance can come in. The whole process, a virtuous cycle of contending with the risk and doing something about it begins. And the scientists who are doing it are Ecuadorian. That's why they've been in the building code. Not because Jem was involved, but because they're well-known scientists who are leading this charge. Now, in closing, I just want to make a few remarks about the Tohoku earthquake um, uh, beyond uh, uh, what we have heard thus far. I think um, we have already heard that we all learned a bitter lesson, that it's very difficult to determine the maximum size of earthquakes uh, in subduction zones. There have been some people who have been arguing that our views, uh, that we were too narrow-minded about this. I think the message, the humble message that we should take from this experience is that even though Japan has 6,000 kilometers of subduction zones, very good monitoring in a long history, there are 40,000 kilometers of subduction zones in the world. You need to study all of them to study Japan's hazards. I'm in California. We have studied the San Andreas very, very closely. But to really understand what the San Andreas might give us, we need to study all of the world's continental transform faults because they also bear witness to the San Andreas' future. So Jim is studying all of these. And we feel that this is um, the way that we will all advance together. And of course, Jim advances through the enormous involvement uh, of Japanese scientists, for which we're very, very grateful. And Jim has received um, recognition in the popular press in Japan for its involvement. And I just wanted to heighten what I think are the strongest reasons for Japan to be cons to consider being a part of this international effort. There's no question that Japan offers an enormous insight, and we would love to work on this together. So I want to close where I began, with the idea that the motivation to build safe structures <coughs> has to be an awareness of risk. You must be convinced of risk. You must believe that you are not being told something because someone has a financial interest and you're buying insurance or fixing something. If you believe it, that's the start of doing something. We have no illusions that just providing that information will suddenly change behavior. But people will no longer have an excuse to ignore the problem. And we believe that starts the process. And so in the same way that these little corner pieces are a very small part of a very big structure. We would like Jim to be a binding element that brings these various elements together and in a very small part strengthens the enterprise of living in an earthquake prone world. Thank you. Not only earthquake, but it's a very general scheme, including 
uh, volcanic eruption, typhoon, or hurricane, or landslide, or uh, say uh, snow avalanche. But for any natural disaster, uh, the uh, emergency management <coughs> is shown such a spiral structure. When disasters occurred here, it is necessary at the first stage the response. And after recovery and the mitigation and preparedness to uh, prepare the next disaster. So uh, this part is sometimes called uh, as crisis management. It's uh, just after the disaster. And later, uh, this is in a risk management in narrow sense here. And at each phase, the necessary point is like this. In the response is defined as e efforts to minimize the hazards created by a disaster. It includes search and rescue, emergency relief, or logistics and information. And in the recovery stage, uh, this is defined as efforts to return the community to the normal uh, before disaster state. Uh, it includes temporary housing, emergency grants, medical care, and so on. And after that, the mitigation is the uh, effort to minimize the effects of disaster. Uh, this includes uh, the very uh, basic work, building codes and zoning, and the vulnerability analysis and warning system. Uh, today, we uh, speak on only this part. And uh, one more phase, preparedness, is the effort to plan how to respond to the next disaster. For that purpose, uh, we need preparedness plans, emergency exercises, or public education. Okay, so uh, let's start a uh, panel discussion to start uh, to raise some key questions about the assessment of seismic hazard and risk. Uh, first one is what was the missing behind unsuccessful assessment of uh, last year's earthquake and tsunami in Japan? And the second point, what kind of data is necessary to reach proper and collect assessment of seismic hazard. And the third one is how uh, such a hazard and risk information uh, should be provided to people. So let's start from this first question. Uh, what was missing? Uh, sometimes we are blamed why you could not uh, predict or forecast the occurrence of uh, March 11th earthquake. So, do you have any opinion? Uh, you, you have already stated something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think please add your opinion. Uh, for uh, 
earthquakes in major or other uh, faults in inland earthquakes, we uh, consider a very long time range, uh, about 100,000 years. So uh, earthquakes in uh, active faults is very uh, rare. So uh, we need uh, to consider a very long time. But uh, for earthquakes in subduction zone, uh, in uh, now Japanese history, uh, more than uh, 2,000 years, uh, we have many experience, and we, based on the uh, experience, uh, we need a uh, we uh, uh, evaluation of uh, urgency uh, is uh, have been very important uh, for us. So. Um, we uh, only consider uh, within our about 500 or less uh, earthquakes because uh, uh, subduction zone earthquake uh, return period is, uh, for example, Miyaken Oki earthquake is 40 years, only 40 years, and uh, Namkai, uh, Tonamkai earthquake is about 100 years. And, uh, uh, more than 10 uh, earthquakes are uh, experienced in our history. So this uh, type of earthquakes are very um, impressive um, for us. So uh, um, the balance is not good. Uh, so uh, if we consider the earthquakes uh, uh, in subduction zone, we consider more than long year, uh, uh, for example, uh, 10, 10,000 or 100,000 years, we can uh, model a um, very large earthquake uh, up to uh, 9 or 10 <laughs> magnitude. So um, it's a, uh, um, I think um, handling of uh, this uncertainty is very important uh, for the assessment of uh, hazard. Uh, now we have a lot of uncertainty to uh, make hazard map, uh, we know a re very little uh, on uh, earthquake. So, um, how to uh, read the earthquake is a very important subject now. Mm. And, uh, oh, and this is a. Uh, uh, mm, cool. If we consider this large <coughs> area, and plot the uh, Gutenberg-Richter law, like this, and plot the uh, Tohoku earthquake in uh, mm, last year. Yeah. So uh, if we assume the Gutenberg-Richter uh, not up to eight, but up to nine, uh, we can uh, uh, model this earthquake, this very large earthquake in this area, and with uh, uh, probability of occurrence. Like oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, as a natural extension, we should uh, prepare minus nine aspects as a result. Mm -hmm. But, uh, say, uh, in short, our scope was confined to uh, only the events of relatively short recurrence period events. So from now, we should extend that yeah. for more rare events, including. Thank you. And, uh, Sebastian, how about the, uh, your opinion now? Why well, we fail? I ask myself, why didn't I see this earthquake coming? I mean, all of us who've worked in Japan uh, have to acknowledge uh, that we didn't have that foresight. Uh, in retrospect, it's quite clear that the evidence for the Jogon earthquake, the 869 earthquake, was inadequately included in the modeling and in the view, in part because that data was just coming out slowly in, in, in an incomplete form at the time in 2005 when the model was established. And um, it's a very large bureaucratic undertaking to create one of these models and some important data comes up, and it's very hard to stop and turn. 
Now, we've also seen that the Jogan earthquake itself was probably much smaller than the Tohoku earthquake. So it's too simple to say, oh, we just should have seen that earthquake occurs every thousand years, and therefore something like this size was coming. That's probably inadequate, too. So we have to recognize this earthquake was astonishingly large, larger than anything likely in the history. And this is the problem in working in an area where you have very rare, very rare, very consequential events. Is all I can say is we have the same biases in California. We're too focused on the 1906 earthquake on the northern San Andreas, the 1857 earthquake on the southern San Andreas. Like the Japanese, we don't even have an end-to-end -end rupture of the San Andreas Fault in our model. So this, is, this lack of foresight is not unique to this situation. And it teaches us that we have to be limber, we have to be more nimble. When evidence shows up, we have to change our thinking. And we have to recognize that our history may not be long enough and complete enough to give us a very good idea of what could happen in the future. I think he has a question. Well, it seems to me that Dr. Fujimara's presentation showed the problem uh, that there was an inadequate model, a mechanism for the propagation of uh, earthquake uh, from one small earthquake to another in the yes. adjacent sectors. Yes. And that's what we should be looking for rather than the occurrence of an extremely large earthquake. We should be looking for evidence of the propagation conditions for propagation of one earthquake sector to an adjacent sector on the fault. Because each of these slips is going to be bigger in uh, impact. When it propagates, it won't be tied down at its end. And so you'll have more than the multiplication or the addition of the uh, individual slips over the width of the fault. She had a question. Uh, hello, my name is Samira Daniels. Um, in another presentation earlier in the week, um, uh, one of the uh, uh, presenters uh, contrasted uh, the, the thinking as uh, uh, Japanese and deterministic and vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, probabilistic. And I was wondering if any, if, uh, any of you gentlemen can uh, state precisely how, how you think how it played out deterministically before this earthquake. What, what, is, what exactly is the content of that deterministic uh, uh, thinking? Um, I suppose both in Japan and the United States, we, we take scenario earthquakes that we think are realistic enough that the public won't dismiss them as outlandish and the Japanese did this for a repeat of the Ansei Edo earthquake, a 7.2 under Tokyo, and found rather devastating consequences. And the Californians have done this for a repeat of the 1906 earthquake as well. And so these are, these are lessons to alert the public to consequences that could happen. But neither country uses those for its hazard forecast. We both use probabilistic thinking, and that's an acknowledgment of the depth of our ignorance. Since we don't know what's coming, the best we can do is give it to you as a game of chance. And if you're a gambler, you know how to deal with that information. For the public at large, it can be difficult. We understand that probabilistic thinking is somehow um, difficult, but it's the best we can do. And we must not tell people that we can predict earthquakes when we cannot. And that shuts out a purely deterministic approach. Maximum uh, subductions on the uh, earthquake. Uh, you showed us uh, Gutenberg, Mr. Kerr. That's a linear output written on 9 or 9.5 uh, in the linear scale. And uh, uh, Dr. Stein mentioned uh, uh, Burton Coden uh, uh, maximum uh, amount to being uh, 9.6 plus 9.5. Now, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if, if uh, there's a uh, burden Kogan uh, 
uh, maximum number is based on uh, just the statistics or uh, if there is a physical reason uh, for that. Uh, because that will uh, limit our maximum uh, sort of uh, preparedness. Uh, the second question is about this uh, uh, your uh, hazard map question, uh, Dr. Hojiwara. Uh, you said you took into, in, in, in case of reduction on earthquake, you took into account only uh, earthquake uh, for which occurred uh, in uh, 500 years. Now, and you said that was because of uh, excessive emphasis on, on urgency. Uh, what do you mean by that, urgency? I mean, you don't, it's a probability uh, argument. And uh, we don't know, even if it's five, one in 500 years, so, we don't know when it's going to happen. So when you talk about hazard, uh, isn't it logical <coughs> to uh, sort of multiply the, uh, the probability and the size of the hazard, and uh, you take not the uh, probability, but uh, average value and simple, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, deviation. Uh, the, the statistical analysis. I, I, I think it's uh, too simple-minded to just take, and I don't understand why 500 years, for example. What's the origin of 500 years? Is it a qualitative and quantitative argument for this 500 years? I want to know that. Uh, the, uh, the, this is the second question. Okay, yes. Uh, for the uh, first question, the uh, maximum uh, magnitude, uh, we, uh, mm, I think uh, that uh, area, of a plate boundary area, is a physical uh, mm, area, uh, determine the maximum magnitude. So, uh, so typically, the fault length is uh, closely related to the magnitude itself, and simply. So uh, the largest aspect is that just surround the Earth, 40,000 kilo, kilometers is the maximum size, theoretically. But actually, uh, there is a uh, geology called segment, segments, something like, uh, so such a long, say, uh, 10,000 kilometers or more, is uh, very difficult to imagine. So a uh, chilly earthquake uh, or something may be the longest, say, uh, straight, uh, straight-like uh, segment length. So I think uh, magnitude 10 or more may be uh, impossible. But only statistical extrapolation, it's possible, of course, uh, that good retaliation we can extend even to magnitude 10 or 11. But it uh, physically or geophysically uh, seems, uh, say, it's, it's very unreliable, uh, un, un, unrealistic, such a big aspect. For second question, uh, for subduction, don't ask me that. Occurrence probability is very high. For example, for Nankai Nankai earthquake or Okarasuke is more than eighty percent. And if uh, we consider such a very high pro uh, probability earthquake and very low probability earthquake, uh, in at the same time, uh, we need uh, 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 to evaluate uh, seismic hazard or uh, ground motion level uh, for uh, uh, low probability aspect uh, uh, mm, for high uh, occurrence probability is very high. Uh, if we consider uh, 10,000 years uh, mm, return period, uh, 10, uh, 
a hundred uh, year return period aspect, we consider uh, a, a hundred uh, and and uh, a hundred thousand uh, return period. We consider uh, we consider uh, one thousand uh, aspect or uh, non-vectoral aspect. So we have to evaluate very uh, tail of the uh, ground motion. Uh, and now our technology have uh, such, uh, have not uh, such a uh, um, uh, resolution for uh, a rare case. So, um, um, it is difficult uh, to evaluate the high probability aspect or low probability and low probability uh, aspect at the same time. So, uh, for um, um, subduction tonal aspect, we uh, couldn't consider a very uh, um, long, uh, long time. So aspect does not always occur on the order of the probability, yeah. but so urgency is also in a sense of statistics. Yeah, yeah. Not the order of earthquake. We, we cannot say the next earthquake is here. But you know, statistically, the high probability, uh, the earthquake having a high probability is uh, made probable uh, compared to the rare event only say such a thing. So we can uh, deterministically say urgency, this earthquake and this kind of earthquake. Only, only statistics, I think. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consulting engineer. Uh, what is being done to combine these various factors on a statistical basis of the probability of magnitudes of earthquake combined with the probability of certain structural features of the buildings and resultant uh, damage to the population to come up with mathematical expectations. That's a question, how to connect the hazard assessment to risk assessment? So there is probabilistic risk assessment and there's two kinds, one in which you have a, a facility, a building on a site, and it's a specific site analysis that's done that considers how that building is engineered. Often there's a finite element analysis of the performance of that building. It's also called performance-based engineering for all nuclear power plants or critical facilities. This is the kind of analysis that's undertaken. It's often undertaken for the purposes of ensuring those buildings. For broader issues, such as how a megacity will respond to an earthquake, there are cruder methods that need to capture the broad characteristics of those buildings, the nature of the shaking that's expected, and to see the consequences uh, in terms of death and damage, as the government of Japan did in that uh, scenario for a repeat of the Ansei Hido earthquake. So this is an evolved field. It is done, and it's done at various levels depending on the amount of of importance that's attached to it. Last question, okay. Uh, yeah, my question is to um, Abraham Abigail, retired foreign service. My question is to Mr. Stein. Uh, closer to home, uh, this uh, area here experienced an earthquake last August, uh, which size was the epicenter in nearby Virginia. The question is, uh, what are the prospects for uh, an earthquake in the Washington, D.C. area, and what can we learn from the Japanese experience? Well, that's one of the most difficult things, to <laughs> connect those dots between Japan and Virginia. Uh, earthquakes are very rare, indeed, on the east coast of the United States, despite the fact that we have had, very occasionally, some rather large ones, maybe magnitude seven and a half in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And so we, we had a historical earthquake in Boston in the 1600s. So the rarity of these earthquakes and the lack of any plate boundary structure makes them particularly difficult to understand and study. 
So if all the earthquakes we're going to do a good job of, those will be last. So yes, there is a, a modest hazard that this area is exposed to. And my reaction as a scientist is we can't possibly do enough monitoring here to understand that. The way to, to understand earthquakes in the interiors of plates is to study them around the world, in Australia, in India, in other places, in Canada, that have similar conditions, and try to group that so we actually get the statistics to give us a little bit more insight as to their occurrence. Well, there's plenty of bureaucracy here to do all the work. <laughs> yeah, hi, Tobias Fischer, uh, National Science Foundation. Um, Japan has the highest uh, density of GPS networks and uh, seismic stations, I presume, as well. Yet, as you said, nobody saw the earthquake coming. I'm wondering, are there any other techniques that maybe have not been explored to try to better uh, forecast or even try to predict an earthquake of that magnitude. I'd just like to get your opinion on that. Well, I'll give an opinion and then Okada said, why don't you give an opinion? I guess uh, such a dense <coughs> seismic or linkage network, such a instrumentation, uh, we cannot say, at present stage, we can say uh, any prediction using uh, such a observed data. But uh, long-term forecast, we need another data, such as geological data or historical documentation or something. So not always uh, such a modern uh, network is necessary for the, uh, say, uh, the, it is a, only one uh, method to approach to such a long-term estimate. You know, science is about falsifying hypotheses. And it's all we've done is falsify about 100 or 150 earthquake prediction hypotheses over the last 30 years. Uh, everything we've tried has failed. And it's humbled us, and we know how difficult the problem is. And theoretical and laboratory-based studies suggest that the nucleation zone for an earthquake, even the size of the Tohoku event, where the slip starts to accelerate from its typical value of maybe a centimeter a year to 3,000 kilometers an hour. That takes place in about three seconds. And the preparation zone may, no, may be no larger than this room. And of course, you're 15, 20 kilometers down. And in the case of Tohoku, you're also 70 kilometers offshore. So is all we can tell you is nothing has worked despite putting enormously sensitive instruments in the ground. Just, just as another example, the Parkfield section of the San Andreas was thought to be overdue for an earthquake. So we put the best <coughs> instruments we had that we could measure very, very small changes in volume and in shear, about a kilometer down in the earth. And the Parkfield earthquake was just a magnitude six. It occurred in 2004. There's no volume changes we could measure. And you could have dropped a jigger of gin into Lake Tahoe. We could have measured that volume change with these instruments. So this is a very, very tough problem. Even the Tohoku forecast, and of course, Okada-san correctly said, we can only call it a forecast in retrospect. So that's just meaningless jargon to call it a forecast. The Japanese have studied this very, very carefully. There is very little that marks that earthquake for future greatness, despite the fact that it occurred two days and only 50 kilometers from the future epicenter. It's tough. Um, uh, as you might imagine, uh, there have been uh, <coughs> is it on? Uh, as you might imagine, there are other events uh, taking place, uh, certainly in Washington, uh, in connection with the uh, the uh, first anniversary. And a couple of days ago, there was one over at Carnegie Endowment that focused on the nuclear side specifically. Uh, some of the speakers uh, characterized the uh, preparation or the, the appreciation of the situation in Japan as one where the, the sort of the cultural end of the panic versus the uh, uh, sort of acquiescence in the world uh, as not having been the case with respect to the, to the earthquake hazard so much 
uh, as it was uh, with respect to the uh, to the tsunami end, uh, and that strikes me as a little odd since tsunamis are clearly part of the uh, uh, the equation there in, in Japan. But uh, in terms specifically, let's say with respect to the way the nuclear industry had looked at it, uh, and, and the fact that, as best I can tell, that the the society as a whole and the nuclear uh, uh, plants as a whole uh, survived the earthquake hazard very well. It was a very large earthquake, but not the tsunami. Uh, was there sort of a cultural issue there as opposed to a, a, a preparation issue in terms of what had gone on in, in technical, society, uh, technical circles in, in Japan over the last 40 or 50 years? I'm not qualified to answer that for much. tsunami, the area hit is very much limited to the coast. In case of earthquake, the entire Japan is vulnerable. So my hometown is Sendai, and my uh, mother's hometown is a small town in uh, San Diego. Nobody cares. I mean, until probably March, uh, uh, March 11. So it's not cultural, but it's uh, well, maybe a uh, hazard evaluation. You multiply the population and uh, the, the damage and uh, uh, the uh, occurrence of this uh, tsunami and so forth. Uh, it's certainly natural for our government to, uh, to well, not consider uh, the tsunami hazard as, as much as the, uh, the earthquake. Uh, that's my understanding why uh, my mother's uh, hometown was demolished. Thank you. Uh, I'm Daniel Petz from Brookings. I have a question. Like, uh, we have uh, a couple of angelists. You saw that we had a couple of major earthquakes like in the last couple of years now. Uh, Japan, Chile, uh, Indonesia. Uh, is that kind of uh, just is there any connection between those, or is it just a statistical outlier? And uh, does the fact that there have been such major earthquakes in just a relatively short period uh, um, make us reconsider our models of kind of how, uh, how often such major earthquakes are occurring? Well, this has been a subject of debate, as you can imagine, in the scientific community over the last several years. Are we in an earthquake mega swarm? or are these unrelated? And um, although there are thoughtful people who are arguing uh, that these earthquakes are related, they're wrong. Um, the, the best statistical studies performed by uh, the three independent groups of outstanding scientists who have recently published papers that show that when you get to these very high magnitudes, you're dealing with statistics of very small numbers. And we might think that the background state, what we would expect, would be regular occurrence rather than a glump. But in a Poisson process, there's lots of glumps. So it, there's not enough of these large earthquakes to make the argument that they are interacting. And in particular, when you drop down to magnitude 7.5 or magnitude 7, there's no increase whatsoever. And it would be odd to have a process that only causes the largest earthquakes to interact, but nothing else. Now there's a there's a caveat to this, which is it's also quite clear from some outstanding research that large earthquakes do trigger very tiny earthquakes all around the globe as the seismic waves encircle the globe. They trigger, though, zeros and ones, maybe twos. There's no triggering that is known for, let's say, magnitude five and larger around the globe. So I would say earthquakes do very strongly interact over the scale of, let's say, Honshu, in the case of the Tohoku earthquake, as Okada-san showed, some of these very remote, interesting aftershocks. But globally, the Chile earthquake is not sensing the Tohoku earthquake, as far as 
we understand. Uh, Steve Fletcher's up. I remember I was in and out of Japan around the time of the Kobe quake, and I can remember the Wednesday after the quake being up in Kyoto City and experiencing an aftershock in the evening. Uh, I've been to some, some discussion about the, I would like to ask the panel what they think, uh, if, if based on um, experience with aftershocks after a very large quake, what they think the probability of an aftershock still coming along of magnitude, shall we say, eight, and if that has some anticipation of such an aftershock in that same region, uh, what preparations are being taken on the, uh, on the, in, in that area of Japan to uh, cope with such an aftershock? Do you want to answer? Yeah. I can answer, but I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> there are several arguments, for example, uh, the Forecast northern extension and the southern extension is the most dangerous. Mm. It's a, because a uh, similar example we have, uh, we, we know the many things, or such as uh, 2004 Sumatran earthquake, eastern extension showed three months later the similar earthquake occurred. So, one, uh, so that is uh, why uh, our institute is now uh, hurry to make the ocean bottom network the both area and the say, northern and southern extension. And the second possibility is the so-called outer rise earthquake. It's a, uh, out of the Japan Trench. It's also uh, such a pair occurrence of such an earthquake, most dangerous earthquake. Uh, we know such an example. So as a possibility, uh, as you know, uh, uh, it may ha ha have some Possibility, but we cannot say uh, how probable is, is that. But we, but we must only cautious say at least the coming several years or ten years we should be cautious, take caution to that kind of aspect. I would agree. I completely agree with that. One thing to keep in mind about aftershocks: they have a universal property that is always observed, which is that. The rate of the frequency of aftershocks decays with one over time. If you look at the frequency in the first day, it's 10 times higher than it is 10, time, 10 days later. 100 days later, it's 100th of what it was on the first day, etc. But the magnitude of aftershocks does not decay at all. The, roughly the largest magnitude you'll see in the first day is similar to the largest magnitude you'll see in the next 10 days, and the largest magnitude you'll see in the next 100. So, there is no all clear signal here. Japan could experience a very large aftershock over the next five or so years because this process is only decaying in frequency, not in magnitude. Let me change the uh, direction of our question, okay? The after uh, the Aichi Nawaji earthquakes, and the, we are warned so much about earthquakes in the region of Shizuoka Prefecture. Okay, so but nothing happened. More than twenty years, you people are warned uh, the, that direction. Any chance we will have earthquakes? So in the Shizuoka prefecture, there are so much uh, worrying these earthquakes. But why did you, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, before Shizuoka prefecture we ha will have uh, earthquakes, the, uh, the other place had uh, such worst, uh, the worst uh, accident. The, uh, so I have always saying your basic Research is very important. However, most important thing is how to defend earthquakes. Okay, so I'm always saying basic basic uh, research is very important. But at the same time, you should cooperate with the uh, engineers. Uh, the, do you have any strong connections, strong arguments, uh, strong the uh, cooperations? 
between you, a basic scientist, and uh, engineers or defense? Defense, yeah. not, defense not, not the uh, presentation. Uh, I think the, in our institute, uh, we have. You, you have some view. Yes, yeah. uh, and the, the testing the actual buildings until the uh, collapse. So we are uh, both the science and engineering group are discussing. I hope you will have a strong uh, cooperation mm. with those uh, engineers. And the, uh, you didn't have such a strong cooperation until, if my memory is correct, until 1995 uh, or so. Mm. Before the uh, Kansai earthquake, <coughs> you didn't have any cooperation. So I propose to, have a co to, uh, to, to promote cooperation. So I, I organized our symposium in Hamamatsu, and you are teaching. Yes, I, 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 yeah, yeah. Right? So even uh, now, I, I'm a little bit afraid cooperation among them, among you, uh, is not so strong. So I hope you will uh, promote this kind of cooperation. In the, recently, not only science and technology, but social science is also included. Right, right. So, to uh, in the very uh, wide spectrum, right. so we will continue the effort. Thank you. Uh, if we detect a particular earthquake occurring, can we predict the consequent tsunami? We if an earthquake occurs, you detect it with your seismometers, can you then predict what kind of tsunami ah, yes. will follow uh, that? Yes, after the occurrence of earthquakes, yes, we can calculate the tsunami propagation and uh, what height of tsunami is attacked at each point of coast. However, the earthquake at Shizuoka that arima san referred to, there would only be three minutes warning. The shaking will probably last three minutes. So in that situation, yes, you can predict it, but if you feel shaky, you should run. Uh, you know, the coast of Tohoku was a little different. There was 20 to 30 minutes warning. And the network that, that Okada-san described that's being installed, and which has no rival anywhere on Earth, will allow you a much better prediction of the arrival time and, and height and character of the tsunami than will be available anywhere. In such a case, we have no time to calculate using supercomputer or something. So we must prepare before the earthquake the uh, data, database uh, at the so-called green function for at each point of ocean uh, wave height causes. Uh, the, and, and only sum up the uh, pre-calculated tsunami. Yeah. So you data. can tell the people at Fukushima that uh, a much higher tsunami wave is coming uh, mm -hmm. than they had anticipated. We hope so. Mm -hmm. Okay, the time is limited. So is there any final question? If you, some person. Okay? Okay, thank you for your cooperation. Thank you very much.